Hi, I'm Chris. Hey, everybody. I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, listeners. It's time for Chris and I to shoot the flames. It's our monthly episode where we sit down to talk about horror news, some trailers that have been released, some movies that we've watched recently, and most importantly, comments and questions from you, our listeners. So, Chris, how's your new year been? Oh, so far, so good. Uh, got delayed at the airport. Now I'm sick as a dog. <laughs> it's a terrible way to start the new year. Oh, my God. And the first movie that we want to do a hot take on is getting, like, dragged across the coals by the reviewers. That's right. I, yeah. So I have, I have tickets to see The Grudge tomorrow at the time of this recording. And um, everything I've read about it is just abysmal. So, um, yeah. Looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> and on top of all that, we're basically on the precipice of World War Three. Mm-hmm. But let's not dwell on these dark and horrible things. Let's go on to a lighter subject. Horror movies. <laughs> so uh, we've gotten lots of comments from our episodes um, recently on social media, starting with our Shooting the Flames episode from last month, December. Um, at Cody Landman says, One, I was also disappointed with Little Monsters. It was too cute for an R-rated movie. Two, Terminator Dark Fate definitely felt like fan service, but it wasn't nearly as fan service as Halloween 2018. Yeah, uh, I didn't see Little Monsters. Don't. Uh, although the trailer looked good. Um, yeah, and then you told me not to, so I didn't. And then, of course, I did see Terminator Dark Fate, which I, I you never you never saw, right? No, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it, I don't know that it felt like... Yeah, it felt like fan service a little bit and like the wrong kind of fan service. Like like the studio thought you wanted this and you actually wanted that and they gave you this like in heaps and you left the theater wanting to puke everywhere. But, you know, <laughs> it was OK, um, you know, but Halloween 2018, I don't know. It was it was a lot more clever and subtle with its fan service, in my opinion. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree. I mean, I haven't seen Terminator, obviously, so I don't know. But based on what I saw from the trailers and what I read about it and what you told me about it, it seems like a lot of fan service, right? Because they're, like, starting right after T2. Isn't that essentially what it's supposed to be? Yeah, it takes place, like, 20 or 30 years later. But, yeah. But they're, it, they're, it they're discounting some sequels. sequels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Whatever. I mean, we'll... Um, I have to see if they make more Terminator movies. They're also they're definitely making more Halloween movies, so we'll just have to see how they carry that that reboot slash remake sort of thing going. Yeah, with that. But I mean, yeah. at political movies said, yeah, that game and story is the vampire genre, and it's true to the label short story. It's only about fifteen pages, if memory hasn't failed. So uh, last December, we read a comment from him where he suggested that we read a vampire short story called Snow Glass Apples by Neil Gaiman. He was commenting on our um, vampire top 10 movies. I still haven't read that short story, so, I mean, sorry. It is on my list, you know. I just, um, no matter how short it is, it's going to take me a little bit of time, probably. Yeah, we have a backlog. But please continue giving us your suggestions. Yes, of course. I'm always looking for new things to read, and I need to try some new Gaiman because I, I just haven't read a whole lot, and I need to do so. Did you say New Gaiman or Neil Gaiman? Neil Gaiman. I literally thought you said, I want to I want to try some New Gaiman. Like, <laughs> like anyway. <laughs> like, like G-A-Y-M-E-N? That too. I, I also want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so keep them coming. Uh, from our interview with the Vampire episode from November, at RL Terry 1 says, Are the Vampire Chronicles in any way connected to the Vampire Diaries? I was a Vampire Diaries fan, but largely unfamiliar with the former. What? <laughs> you better answer this one because I'm about to leap through this fucking computer and strangle someone. Uh, no, the Vampire Diaries are not connected to the Vampire Chronicles. As far as I know, I mean, like... I, no, no, absolutely not. They are not connected. I, I've never seen any of the Vampire Diaries TV shows. So At R.L. Terry is a long, long, long time. Well, I guess we haven't been around that long. But since this podcast uh, inception, you know, uh, he has always commented and always given us questions. And he's amazing. Um, but I was under the impression that he was at least our age or older. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how old he is. I mean, I, he's... He's got to be. Yeah, everyone has their little blind spots. God knows I do. And so, yeah, uh, Interview the Vampire, you know, is a book series that started in the 70s. 
uh, as we said in the uh, in the episode. But uh, the Vampire Diaries is completely separate, you know, uh, for for teens. And I mean, I I have to say that a lot of people know Interview with the Vampire solely from the movie, right? And so they may not be aware that there's a huge long book series and whatnot. And I mean, the Vampire Diaries was a long running show. And I think it had spinoffs of its own too. So I mean, it's it's easily confused, but um, yeah, it's not not connected. So from our hot take on Doctor Sleep at Friday Thirteenth, hi guys, says was super happy with the outcome of your review because I didn't want to have to yell, laugh out loud. <laughs> no need to yell. We both like that movie quite a bit. And um, the guys over at Friday the Thirteenth have released their like top five movies of the year, and Doctor Sleep was toward the number one area for both of them i don't think it was number one for both but i think i think maddie chose that as number one so okay good choice um and it may be pretty high on our lists as well that's right we have a uh, year review episode coming up in january so look out for that and see where dr sleep falls on our lists it's probably going to be pretty high though so um from our episode top 10 slashers at matthew t mchenry says arguably your best episode so far happy new years that is an incredible compliment thank you so much now i heard that from a couple other people as well and i think it's just because uh you know you did you were able to do your distinct top 10 and then i was able to bring some of that history to the table and i think it was just a little bit more information in different ways for people in just one episode and i think that's something that we definitely want to bring to the table in the future where we can where it makes sense yeah i i really enjoyed the format change i was kind of on the fence about it when you know chris you know told me what he was thinking and i think it worked out really well and you know i was kind of hoping to hear from more listeners as to what they thought um so if if you've listened to that episode It's not too late to reach out and let us know what you thought about it. Let us know what you think about the history and, you know, the top 10, because we might want to do that again in the future. And finally, for our episode on Black Christmas, we got an anonymous comment that said, I wanted to say I love that you showed understanding to Peter in the uh, Black Christmas episode and didn't completely vilify him. I agree with everything you said. Jess definitely had the right to choose, but you also showed the emotional distress that caused Peter by having it all thrown on him and wanting to have the baby. I know that there are some who wouldn't see his side at all, but I also agree that the threat he made to Jess was a bit much. So yeah, we talked to that about that a little bit in um, in our Black Christmas episode, obviously, and it was just uh, I think a Peter character like he had lost his like career essentially, uh, you know, and his relationship and potentially a child all kind of in the same day. And at the end of the day, he still tried to help her, and he he dies anyway. So. Uh, I don't know, like if horror is in a way, some people describe horror as like a practice of extreme empathy, right? Like you can see multiple perspectives. It always shows you uh, or almost always shows you the perspective even of the bad guy, right? Like we do have a tiny bit of empathy for like Norman Bates, right? And a couple of these others. We definitely have some sympathy for Hannibal somehow, yeah, you know? And so this guy is not a murderer. He's just basically, you know, said, you'll be sorry. Uh, as ambiguous it was, it was a threat, you know, and the story, basically the narrative, uh, which is very feminine, kills him for it. Basically, it's also kind of bending over backwards to make you think he's the killer. But yeah, we did want to kind of acknowledge his side of things, um, you know, without, you know, stamping our approval on on anything that he might have said as far as threatening nature, because obviously that is absolutely um, not okay. No, not at all. And this person sent us this comment in a DM. He didn't want to sort of like create a longer thread of, you know, arguments and things like that. And I mean, I don't, I don't really know that that would have happened. I think that our listeners or people, you know, can, can have a conversation about things. And I don't think that anything that he said in that, dm was was terrible you know and i don't i don't think that anything we said about peter was terrible i mean ultimately at the end of the day it's a woman's right to choose it's her body um but you have to remember that you know it takes two people to sort of like make a baby and in this particular situation you know i like to think that maybe peter would have eventually taken her side and helped her through her choice 
but yeah or not you know at least have a conversation at the end of the day it's her choice period yeah you know but at least having that conversation i understood where he was coming from with his frustration and panic you know that he might lose a child and it wouldn't be his choice you know so he's trying to have that conversation and she's wasn't having it but you know that's also her choice so anyway that's a whole thing watch about christmas you'll understand yeah so we got a question from Dave, who called into our hotline and left us a voicemail. Let's give that a listen. Hey guys, this is Dave. Uh, with the decade coming to an end, I had a question. What are some of your favorite movies from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s? Anyway, I uh, love you guys, love the podcast, and with that, I leave you my famous evil laugh. <laughs> uh that was a great evil laugh and maybe a little bit sexy so (laughs) so i believe we're both fairly prepared for this question yeah so uh i have been putting some thought into it since your voicemail and so i think that we've decided to give you our favorite movies or our favorite movie from the decades from 80s 90s 2000s and 2010s uh i started with the 70s did you really yeah just for just to one up you yeah. I'm not even quite sure I can pick a favorite horror movie from the 70s. What, what is it? Tell me what yours is. So I can't just, you know, it, it would have taken me so much longer. But we're a Letterboxd uh, podcast here. We both use Letterboxd to kind of track the movies we have seen or are seen through the year. And uh, just to keep track of our scores and what we thought, you know, initially. And so I essentially, at one point, I sat down probably for a couple hours last year and just like, went through like almost every movie I've ever seen and rated it. So I was able to go into Letterboxd and we don't have any partnerships. So don't think this is like an advertisement or anything. Um, but if you want to sponsor us Letterboxd, we're here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's kind of social, uh, right? Can you, can we share, like, could we have a profile on Letterboxd as the film flamers? Yeah, I think, I think that we can. I mean, right now it's us individually, but I think we can have a, we, we may disagree on something. We'd have to find a common ground to, to rate it or whatever, but we could do that. Well, yeah. If you gave it a two and I gave it a three, we would just say two and a half, you know? Yeah. Of course, that'd be hard for like Knife Plus Heart with like a two and a half and a five. We'd have to like... Yeah, we're not talking just about that. Just say three and a half, we'd round up. <laughs> so, I mean, until then, you could look for both Chris and I to, to follow. So. so anyway, it was easy for me to kind of go back to the 70s and just filter by the 70s and then rate uh, and then sort it by like my rating. So I was able to go to each decade and see like what's the most, uh, you know, what's the highest rated horror movie or closest to a horror movie that I have. And so I was able to do that. How did you compile your list? Well, so when I started using Letterboxd, I, um, I'm i only doing things that I've seen like new. I'm doing it organically, so I'm not going back. If I rewatch something, I'll, I'll list it. But I just, you know, did sort of my thing from memory or the movies that I remember liking the most in that particular decade. For sure, maybe some of the things that I've watched the most. Because, I mean, unlike Chris, he, he will watch movies a couple times. I will watch movies like five or ten times, you know, before I'm, I'm done with that particular movie. And sometimes I'm never done with it. So Yeah. And sometimes the movies I want him to watch zero times. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I'm too busy watching something for the 17th time. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your 70s choice? <laughs> My 70s choice was Alien. Oh, yeah, that's a really, I mean, it is technically 1979, so yeah. Yeah. And my 80s choice was Poltergeist. Okay. My 90s choice was Silence of the Lambs. Ooh. And my 2000s choice was Sunshine. Okay. And my 2010s is The Witch. Very good choices. Um, I didn't prepare a 70s choice. Um, If I did, it would probably be The Exorcist. You know, I just, I really like that movie quite a bit. It's one of the few movies that were, you know, horror movies that were nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. And um, I mean, it's just a really, really good movie, in my opinion. My 80s choice um, is <laughs> A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, Dream Warriors. Of course. <laughs> so, I mean, no substance there, really. But it was one <laughs> of the <laughs> one of the first movies that I really latched on to. First horror movies that I latched on to as a kid. And I've just seen it so many times since my youth to now. And um, I just, I love that movie so, so much. Isn't that your like number one favorite movie of all time besides Magnolia? No, no, it's not. Oh. (laughs) 
In fact, it's not even like I, there are horror movies I like more than that, but it's definitely in my top ten. I just, I mean, I really, really enjoy Dream Warriors a lot, probably more than most people do. I don't know. Um, my '90s choice was Scream. I think it was a really definitive 90s horror movie and really brought horror back into a place, you know, that we are now. I almost chose Scream. I almost chose like copycat. It's like I had to get out of like podcast mode. I had to get out of slasher mode. Yeah. Just like that's why I just went to my letterbox. I was just like there. It was hard for me for the 2000s to pick Sunshine because there were some more more like solid horror, more, you know, solidly horror genre. Uh, choices, but I just love Sunshine so much I had to pick it. And for my 2000s choice, I chose the Zack Snyder remake of Dawn of the Dead. I knew you would. I was thinking that because it was on my list too, and it was the other choice. And I, it was really, really hard for me to to choose that that movie. There were so many good horror movies for me, and like in the aughts. And um, but I mean, I squarely loved that movie. I saw it several times in the theater, and to me, it just really gave me a renaissance and what like good horror movies could be. And it showed me what the future of horror was. Now, what's interesting to me is in the, in the aughts, we did have a huge amount of good horror movies, but yeah. I don't know that we had a huge amount of great horror movies, right? Like I, it was easy for me to like go between a couple for the seventies and eighties, nineties and 2010s, like the witch and it follows and midsummer, you know, and um, Dr. Sleep hell, you know, and for the 2000s it was just like a bunch of like three and a half or four stars with like the ring and the grudge and like all those and i just i i just had to to choose my only like four four star there which was like a sunshine my choice for the 2010s um i went back and forth between several movies but i think my favorite was it follows um that movie scares the shit out of me like every time i watch it it's so tense and i just enjoy enjoy the hell out of it like yep. every time I watch it. That's the one that I had to choose the witch over very, very slightly because I gave the witch a five star and I gave it follows a four and a half. So the only other movie that I would have like put into contention, I mean like the only, the, you were talking about the, you know, not great movies in the odds, but good movies. <clears throat> the only other movie that I could have substituted Dawn of the Dead for was Hostel. And I, I mean, I, I, I really wanted to put that as number one for the odds. And I do like that movie quite a bit, but um, Dawn of the Dead was just better in that particular sense. Yeah. And normally this is the part in our Shooting the Flames where we talk about new patrons or new reviews, and we have zero goose egg, right? None. Yeah. So we're going to need you guys' help. We haven't had a review in a long time. And before we get too much further in Shooting the Flames, I would like to talk about some of the changes that we've actually just made for our patreon page which is we have simplified our tiers so essentially for two dollars now you will only have access to all bonus content you will have early access to all of the episodes on our main feed sometimes one day two days sometimes two weeks three weeks ahead of time right so you'd have early access and obviously you'll have access to our patreon community page uh and we're going to include your screen name starting jan you know starting right now in january we're going to include your patreon screen name in the show notes of every episode so that's all just for tier one and it gets better from there and that's all just as a thank you uh to give you guys just more stuff um for being our benefactors on patreon and i just wanted to to shout that out just to let you guys know about it before we get too much further and for our you know continued patrons we need to thank you for the support you've given us month after month uh we hope you're enjoying the bonus content that we have out there for you and you know let us know what you think of it and um you know as far as the reviews goes guys head over to apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review a little um short snippet of what you think about the podcast we'll read it right here on shooting the flames we always appreciate those and it's been a while since we've gotten one we're getting lonely so lonely you mostly review at night mostly (laughs) so yeah anyway uh existing patrons look for your names in the show notes because we're gonna put them right there right there in the spotlight (laughs) horror news first up rotten tomatoes says 2019 was the best year for horror in four decades 
I believe it. Yeah, the average tomato meter was like something like above 80% or something and and for the first time since like the 70s or something. So I think it's said 1980. 1980 was the last year that we had a, a overly fresh year in that yeah. article. Oh yeah, so it was actually like over 60% or something. It was like the first <laughs> fresh year for horror. Yeah, and I believe it too because we've gotten some gems. Uh the 2010s, uh, especially the late 2010s, I would say have been rife with great horror, not just good horror. So, it's kind of a renaissance which we're really enjoying. Probably part of the reason why we started our podcast. Yeah, I mean, really. So, we've gotten lots and lots of good horror movies and I think that people are starting to appreciate horror in a way that they may have done back in the eighties. So it's no surprise that, you know, over time, this is the, the freshest years that we've had since 1980 in that article. I think they said like the, one of the lowest years was 2006 or something like that. So it's pretty recent, but, um, uh, I went back to look at some of the movies that were released in 1980. So I could see why that year was so fresh in comparison to, to 2019 and we had movies like Altered States. Um, the Changeling is in that year. Friday the 13th is in that year. Um, the Fog. Tons and tons of horror movies. And um, The Shining, right? So I think perhaps that one sort of pushed it over the edge yeah. as far as freshness goes. Um, however, I do want to point out that there was a movie released in 1980 called Erotic Nights of the Living Dead, which I have not seen but I so now we absolutely have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I have been saying all year long that 2019 has just been a fantastic year for horror. And um, I, I really hope that trend continues. But I mean, I, as far as like, at least since like 2000, I think that this has been like the best year, like almost every horror movie that I've seen has been three stars or above. Well, and they're saying their certified fresh hits are like Us, Crawl, Ready or Not, Midsummer, uh, even Child's Play at 63%. Pet Cemetery is almost at 60%. Mm-hmm. But that's good compared to the horror remake average of 44%. Right. You know, so even then it's, it's pushed us up to, uh, you know, of course, I think Black Christmas might have put us back under the. <laughs> 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 what did Black Christmas find the remake finally? Oh, it's forty percent. Yeah, and even womp, that's womp. not terrible, though. I mean, like I've I've seen lower percentages for horror movies. I mean, Hell the Grudge right now is sitting at like seventeen percent. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard for me. Like it's hard for me to spend money on going out to see that movie when it's only sixteen percent, and the audience score is like the same or less or something. And we we never see that. So so I haven't gone back to check some of these movies' um, audience score in comparison to you know what 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 the you know, critics' score is. But I would like to think that they're pretty high as well. I think critics love movies like Midsummer, and I think audiences did too okay so i read an article from the new york daily news recently where um i don't know if they did an interview with him or they were just picking something up from ap but apparently m night Shyamalan doesn't think that he makes horror movies (laughs) so um in this article right to the horror fucking ghetto again god i mean for real so in this article he was like no i make mysteries because at the end of a mystery you learn something so inherently my movie must be a mystery uh i don't think that my horror movies or i don't think that my movies are horror so i don't really fit into that genre um and I wholeheartedly disagree with his own Me <laughs> assessment too. of his films. I mean, I think that the horror community sort of latches on to movies like The Sixth Sense. I mean, it's one of the highest grossing, quote unquote, horror movies nominated for Best Picture and other Oscars, right? And um, to to sell that movie short of its, like, horror-ness... It's ridiculous to me. God, like, not to even not just talk about like the ones that he directs himself. What about the ones he like produces, like Devil? Yeah, you know where they're stuck in the elevator with Satan. You know, (laughs) you know, (laughs) wacky hijinks ensue that involve a lot of blood. So it's like, okay, it's like, no, I don't want to be. You know, I do what I do, and I don't want to be in that. You know, grouped in with that crowd or something. It's like that's such horror ghetto bullshit. It's like no one liked him to begin with. It's like now I like him even less. <laughs> I mean, I like the I like the Sixth Sense, you know, and I I I think uh, the visit that he did, you know, a couple years ago is a squarely horror movie. I looked it up on IMDb and it's listed as a horror movie on there. 
So I, I don't know. I just think that M. Night Shyamalan needs to, you know, heal himself and go back and revisit <laughs> some of his movies and come and say why they're not horror movies. Even The Village oh, is kind of a horror see, movie. See, that's actually my favorite of his. And I know that's really unpopular, but I just love the violin soundtrack so goddamn much. But also Sigourney fucking Weaver's in it. And yeah. it's, it's probably uh, Dallas Bryce Howard's. Um, or Bryce Dallas Howard's best acting work she's ever done is stacked cast Adrian Brody and like, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is in it. Like it's, it's a just, good movie. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I felt it was a horror movie when I was watching it, even um, the happening, right. That's M. Night Shyamalan, right? Like that's oh, a no, horror movie, but no, he wants to be a mystery because of his twist. It's a twist. <laughs> And for the record, M. Night, you can learn things at the end of a horror movie, too. That's not not the only thing. <laughs> Mysteries aren't the only movies that you learn things from at the end. And I'm sure, I know that's not what he meant, but I read this article and I was just flabbergasted. I was like, when will directors stop saying, no, I don't make horror movies? You know, just embrace it. Horror movies make a lot of money. They have a huge devote fandom. Go with it. Say yes. I make horror yeah. movies. The Sixth Sense is a horror movie, and that's it at the end of the day. It's like genre filmmakers, like any other community, like don't eat yourselves alive. You know, just fucking own it. Anyway, speaking of things that no one wanted or asked for, <laughs> <laughs> the Craft remake has wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And one of the actresses in it, uh, Michelle Monaghan, has said, um, is quoted as saying, it's a terrific group of young actresses. It was a really female production. It was fantastic. It's spooky, but also really timely and relevant in terms of what it's about and how it's reimagined. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm on the fence with this one. If they do something like just modernizing the same thing, whatever, we'll see. Um, it does have David Duchovny in it. Oh, which really? is, you know, interesting, you know, but of course the original with Robin Tunney and Faruza Balk and Nev Campbell and Rachel True is, uh, I don't know. Like, I feel, I feel like it's aged fairly well. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, if they just add like cell phones in it, I'm just gonna roll my eyes and. I I haven't watched the original Craft, and it's it had to have been like 15 years or so. But I I loved that movie so much when I was younger, and I mean, but I've said on this podcast before that I I don't mind horror remakes or horror reboots. I'm usually kind of curious to see what a fresh perspective will bring to the story, and I mean more often than not. I'm not completely disappointed. So, I mean, we just got finished talking about how much I love the remake of Dawn of the Dead. And that's one of my favorite horror movies ever. You know, the original. Well, it's very standalone, right? It stands completely on its own versus just like what we were talking about earlier with Rotten Tomatoes, average scores, the average score of a, of a remake, a horror remake is like 44%. You know, it's so I'm, you know, I'm open. I'm obviously open to the remakes, but I'm very cautious with my feelings i have to protect myself robert <laughs> the craft is very important to me and to all of us i mean everyone in the 90s well i can't say everyone in the 90s loved the craft but i mean the soundtrack alone was amazing so if this movie comes out i have to watch that movie every couple of years i'd like to cover that movie actually i it's been a while since i've watched it i listen to the soundtrack more often than i watch the movie so if this remake comes out and has a shitty soundtrack then no i'll have none of it here here <laughs> when is it coming out did they say doesn't say i'm assuming unless they like keep it just like they did for like the young x-men or whatever the fuck they're called new mutants um oh. I, you know I, I would assume that it since it's wrapped you know that it's going to be sometime in 2020 yep i would think so too probably for october i would have rather them do like a sequel to it with like fruza vault coming back yes and be like bitch i'm out of the asylum <laughs> let's call the corners <laughs> <laughs> mister we are the weirdos i'm gonna make you watch empire records for a flashback episode i've seen it several times i like it. have you okay yeah. she shaved her head for that movie and so she had to wear a wig for the entire craft i didn't know that coming soon so first up, I wanted to talk about a trailer for a movie called St. Maud, which is coming out, I think, in April. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, watch this trailer? Yes, and it has Jennifer Eel. 
<laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> You've never seen the original Pride and Prejudice from BBC from 1995 with Colin Firth? Oh, no, I have not. Oh, my Jesus. It's like my one of my favorite things ever. Like if I'm ever like in a little down mood or something and I, you know, I'm just going to, you know, make myself some macaroni and cheese and curl up on the couch and watch Pride and Prejudice or something, because that's my little inner queer, I guess, because (laughs) my God, I mean, I just I have never swooned in my life, but Watching that, I will swoon every time, multiple times. You have to watch that. I'm going to make you watch. It's like a six hour fucking miniseries. Well, I've seen the one with um, Kira Knightley. Isn't no, that enough? It's a movie. No. No. If I'm going to do Jane it's Austen, and superior. it's, it's going to be Sense and Sensibility. I'm sorry. That's just, it's the better novel. I love Sense and Sensibility, but I'm sorry. This uh, this miniseries was amazing, and I'm not the only one. There is a frothing fervor online. <laughs> No, it's a classic. It's it it launched the career for Colin Firth and Jennifer Eel. Uh, okay, so who is Jennifer Eel in Saint Maud? Is she the um, the one she's taking care of? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I, I was watching this trailer, and I'm sure we'll talk about the trailer more. But let's talk about this particular actress. I thought it was Mary McDowell from um, that fucking Cylon show. Mary McDonald. Yeah. Okay. Is that her name? I think so. Dances with Wolves. Let me say it again. What's her name? Mary McDonald. Mary McDonald. Mary McDonald. I thought it was Mary McDonald from Battlestar Galactica. That's what yes. the name of that show is. Mary McDonald from Dances with Wolves and Battlestar Galactica and a number of other things. It looked like her for a minute, and I was just like, "Oh, I like her." But no, it's Jennifer Eel, and she was actually going to be. She was cast and did shoot Game of Thrones as. Um, Mama Stark, but they were seriously. Yeah, no, no. Mama Stark, not Lannister. What the fuck was Mama Stark's name? I can't even remember anymore. She did. Cat, <laughs> cat, or something. Um, That's right. Yeah. So yeah, Catelyn Stark. Right. So she was. She actually played that in the uh, pilot that they had to rework, and by then time she was not available. So they got their second favorite actress to do it for the rest of the show. Before she did. <laughs> I like but anyway, the, a lot. the trailer, <laughs> the trailer we'll looks, looks, looks actually really good. Um, it reminds yes. me of Carrie in a weird way. Yes, it's like an adult Carrie or something. I mean, like I don't know. And A twenty four has been like just knocking shit out of the park For like, every time they now. release a movie. Yeah, I'm just like I love it. I just every time every year they have to have at least one good horror movie that I latch on to. I mean, so last yeah. year was like Midsummer, and like St. Maude is probably going to be the one for this year. This movie looks amazing to me. I cannot wait to see it. It's filled with like tons of like religious horror and I love it. Yeah. Just love it. It looks really good. It looks high quality. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. I was very surprised. I hadn't heard of it before. I just, I saw it on your list for the trailers and I just watched it today. I had seen it mentioned, you know, in news articles here and there, but I mean, I watched the trailer a couple weeks ago and then I, I put it on our, our notes for this show and I was just like, okay, like I, this is one I definitely have to see. Yeah. God, I, I will pay you to watch Pride and Prejudice <laughs> just so I can see you <laughs> crying and like frothing. I don't know. You Maybe that's frothing. why I haven't watched it yet. I mean, I, I love that novel so much. Jane Austen is like one of my favorite my favorite authors. So God, it just brings it home so well. Ugh. Gives me shivers. I showed it to Matt because he is so not like a queer like me. <laughs> and I showed it to Matt and he was swooning. He was like, that was really fucking good. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll watch it. But I'm coming to Boston to watch it. I don't want to watch it by myself. I don't think Rob will watch it. With He'll me. watch it with you. Yeah. You think so? Yeah, he'd watch, he'd watch it with you. Okay. It's not fucking horror. <laughs> he also wants to watch um, that one TV show with you that I told you to with the boys. Oh yeah, it's on our so it's good. on our list for yeah. the list. And the new season's coming out too. He definitely so. wants to watch it with you because um, I talked to him about it and he said, "Yeah." All right. Our next trailer is called "The Woman in the Window," and my God, this 
cast is stacked. Amy Adams, yes. Gary Oldman, Anthony Mackie, Wyatt Russell, Brian Tyree Henry, whoever that is, Jennifer Jason Lee, and Julianne Moore. Jennifer Jason Lee. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, the trailer itself is kind of like, wah, wah to me, but the cast was so amazing. And by God, like, Amy Adams... I just love her and I, she's she's due for an Oscar and I would lo- I would love her to win an Oscar for a movie that's sort of like horror adjacent. I root for anyone that was in Drop Dead Gorgeous. Amen. <laughs> but I mean like this movie looks so 1990s horror adjacent to me and I mean that's sort of like squarely in our heart space and if you've listened to our podcast before so I'm I'm here for it. Well, you usually don't see these many big names in even horror adjacent stuff, let alone like this looks straight up, you know, horror, psychological thriller, mystery, whatever. I mean, it's like straight up copycat, right? So, I mean, she's agoraphobic, can't leave the house, you know? I mean, it's just like the things that we've grown to love in our like horror adjacency. Yeah, it's a device, but it's a good one. And... I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I love the, the the little. Also, they throw in another device, which is she can't really trust what she sees. Right? True. Yeah, because she's medicated, and so you get some cool scenes where, like, she's holding up a sheet or whatever, and there's like a knife that goes through it. And she drops the sheet, and no one's there. Uh huh. You know, and it's like holy shit. So it's uh, it looks really, really interesting. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. Yep, yeah, me too. Yeah, it looks like we're gonna have a great year for horror in 2022. So. 2020 as well i guess i should say 2022 (laughs) we're really looking forward well into the future (laughs) yeah so next up was a trailer for a movie called come to daddy and really i just put it on the list because i wanted to say come to daddy (laughs) but um no it's a it looks like a legit horror comedy starring elijah wood mm -hmm. and i don't know that it's going to be wide release just but like by looking at it but i'm into it it looks good. It looks funny. It's making the festival rounds right now. So I've I've read some things on Twitter and online and people seem to like it quite a bit. And I, I, mean, I trust Elijah Wood when it comes to horror. I mean, he's a big fan of the genre. And I, I think that he's like putting his money into some of these movies and he's acting in the movies that he wants to. And, um, you know, I, I sort of like trust him. And I really enjoyed the shit out of this trailer. It looks funny. It looks gory. It looks a little scary. And... I'm here for it. So yeah, yeah, me too. Plus, I mean, I think Elijah Wood's kind of hot, you know, in a like boy next door kind of way. Well, it's not that he's hot; it's that he doesn't age. Like seriously, (gasps) yeah, he doesn't look a day (laughs) older than he was in 1999 when he was filming Lord of the Rings. Like seriously, like 21 years ago, he looks exactly the same age. It's so weird. Well, I mean, that's what money and plastic surgery will do for you. Well, he has a really shitty haircut in this trailer. (laughs) Yeah, he does. I think this is an Australian movie, although everyone seems to have an American accent. So, yeah, I don't know. Either way, it's um, it's it's a fun trailer. Go check it out. We're going to link it in the show notes along with the rest of these trailers. And I would like to know what some of our listeners think about it or if they're looking forward to it. And what you think about Elijah Wood's horror career, because he seems to be doing a whole lot recently. Next up, we've got none other than A Quiet Place 2, starring Killian Murphy and Emily Blunt. Also coming back as director is, uh, of course, Emily Blunt's husband, John Krasinski, who starred in the first one as a husband. Yeah, this trailer dropped on New Year's Day. Early in the morning, I had woken up after, you know, our night's festivities and drinking, and Twitter was flooded (laughs) with this trailer. And I watched it and immediately told Chris, I was just like, oh, oh, shit. I was like, I have my doubts that maybe it wasn't going to be quite as good as the first one, but I, I'm i really looking forward to this now. Well, I don't know, because I just, I know that it, it just reminds me of like the get out and then the us thing, right? Where it's like, the first one was lightning strikes, and then the next one was like forced. And I know that John Krasinski said, no, there's not going to be a quiet place too. Like we don't have a story and we never planned to. And then everyone was just like, give us more. And finally he relented and uh, like the cutie pie that he is. And, um, <laughs> and basically did this. And so I'm hoping that it's not too forced, but based on the trailer, you know, I'm, Somehow I was more interested in, I guess, the flashback to when these aliens or whatever the fuck they are first got there 
and it's really well shot. Like it's really tense, like World War Z types of, I shouldn't say that because everyone hates it in the community. Um, but really tense (laughs) and, uh, and it looks really, really good. And then of course it, it kind of moves into this, you know, okay, we tried to kind of hunker down and, and live our lives as normally as possible, but we're seeing that it may not be possible, you know, and what are we going to have to do? What are lives going to be like just to try and survive and survive with other people? And it's alluded to that the other people that are left are not good people. And so that's kind of the whole thing is it's going to be a little bit more human adversity in this film versus the first one. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I got that too. And I have to agree. I think that those those flashback moments at the start of the trailer were amazing. I mean, like it were my favorite parts of the trailer, especially when she's like having to like drive in reverse away from that bus and you can see that alien coming out of the window. And I was just like, this is amazing. But I also really enjoy apocalyptic movies where the adversary is not quite, you know, the monster or the zombie or whatever that's chasing you. The people that you have to live with in these situations are equally as terrifying or sometimes more than. Yeah. And I like that when it's more subtle, like at the original Dawn of the Dead, where, you know, that the message gets beat you over the head without them ever saying it. Yeah. Versus in this, they're literally saying it right there in the trailer. The people that are left aren't good, you know? <laughs> it's like. Well, and, and you know, we're, we're coming off a time where we've had The Walking Dead for all these seasons, and that's exactly what that show has dealt with, you know, more so than the zombies. It's the, the humans as antagonists. And I mean, I think that sort of storyline works. And I, I hope that it works better in a really shorter, you know, environment than a long form television series. Mm-hmm. I trust John Krasinski to make a good movie. And I certainly trust Emily Blunt to carry on that character quite a bit. Cause I think that she was like, you know, just a, a shining star in that movie. She was so good. Yeah. I'm still kind of upset that she didn't get more like awards for that. Performance. Yeah. I think she was nominated for a SAG and that was it. Like she, she definitely deserved a lot more recognition for for her work in that movie. Yeah. And I mean like if she, if she continues on and it seems like she's she's sort of doing show. She's she's the biggest, you know, star in this particular movie because I mean that character is, you know, spoiler dead, John Krasinski's character is dead. And I mean she's the one who has to carry it. And I mean if she continues the way that she did in the first one, I I mean hopefully we can get some sort of recognition for her work, you know, after this one's released. Yeah. So finally, our last trailer we wanted to talk about is Dracula, which is the limited series coming to Netflix. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what they're trying to do here. Um, Originally, from the first two trailers, I thought they were trying to really get back to the novel with how things are described with character descriptions and and really kind of bringing it back to that era and everything else. And um, I don't know that that's really needed. Uh, We keep seeing people try and do Dracula like every couple of years. And I think the last real successful one was literally Bram Stoker's Dracula from like 1991 or whatever it was yeah. uh, by Francis Ford Coppola. And I don't know, because I was like, okay, they're really bringing it back to the book. It's going to be interesting to see what they do to make it like super, super in line with the text. And what I'm confused by is like seeing the trailer and I'm seeing like all the nuns like stock up on like steaks and stuff <laughs> like armoring themselves and everything else. I'm like, no, they're doing something else. And then like the cast, I, there's no like people that I recognize, which is fine. That's great. I love a new cast. It, 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 it keeps me in it a little bit more immersed if I've never seen them before in a way, but at the same time, like Dracula looks so goddamn bland the production looks so goddamn bland. Like it looks like a TV movie, which technically I guess it is, but I mean, it is, um, (laughs) you know, it just, I was like, they didn't really go for a stylish flair. They didn't, they're not really doing anything new that I know of except. I don't know. It's, it's, it looks kind of messy. So, well, it comes out literally tomorrow as of this recording, so we'll just have to see. So I did not watch any of the teaser trailers for this limited series yet. So, I mean, this is the first trailer that I've watched. And I knew absolutely nothing about this until, I mean, I, at least I knew it was like done by the BBC or something like that. Yeah, I thought so too. And But one thing that does make me a little bit more excited about it is that it's done by the same people that did Sherlock, which I like. Yeah. Yeah. 
Although I have to disagree, though. I think I think it looks good. I think that the, the way that Dracula looks is sort of a combination of like Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee done in sort of like a 90s come like 2010 sort of way. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm okay with the way that he looks and I'm, I'm sort of okay with the way that the show looks itself. It looks a little different, you know. He looks a little neighborly, and, though. Like you're like your used car salesman neighbor next door or something, you know. Hey, like I, don't I mean, know. whatever works for him to like kill people. That one particular scene where all the nuns are like grabbing their stakes and pulling it out. I mean, that was enough for me to be like, okay, I'll watch this. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> See, that's the like, thing okay. that was like, oh, they're really departing, you know. But I mean, I and, and it's so it's okay. It's okay to like you know change things a little bit, you know. I, so we are going to be talking about Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula in February. I think we can go ahead and announce that at this point, right? Yeah. So maybe um, maybe a good hot take for February would be a comparison to this particular Dracula. How many yeah. episodes is it, first of all, before I commit to any I don't of know. that? <laughs> I think uh, it'll have to be some sort of Patreon thing. Because mm. I really want to watch Underwater with Kristen Stewart. Oh, yeah. I do want to see that, too. Yeah. Okay. But, of course, that comes out this month. So it'll be a late hot take. But whatever. We'll see what else is coming out in February. Uh, it might be a stinking pile of crap like everything else she's done. Who knows? Oh, that is not <laughs> even true. She's made some good movies. We'll, we'll discuss that like... when we talk about Underwater. Like Still Alice. She was great in that movie. I've never heard of it. It's not a horror movie. She's, <laughs> she's really good in that. And God, God help me, and don't come at me, Twitter. Oh God, don't say it. I like the Twilight. Series. Oh my God. <laughs> and that's I okay. like the books too. That's okay that you like I mean, it. We don't shame here. I mean, it's fine. No, it's a no shame zone. You can come out of your Twilight closet. I, I was never in the fucking closet when I was. I mean, I've always told people I like Twilight. It's okay. I mean, you can actually come at me. It's fine. I mean. It's whatever. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's safe to say that we're going to be watching Dracula on Netflix and we, we may or may not want to talk about it just depending how good or bad it is. So, I mean, stay tuned. I'm sure we'll bring it up again at some point. Recommendations. Chris, have you been watching movies? Yes, I have. Lately? Yeah. What have you been watching? I've been doing my catch up, you know, so I've been watching things like Ma. And crawl and harpoon. Ah, <laughs> yeah. I still need to see um, parasite. As do I. And you told me not to see fabric. In fabric, yeah, yeah. And I also want to see the Joker because I keep being told that it's horary, and I don't know. It's made like a billion dollars, so I guess I should get on the bandwagon at some point. Um, so you know, I've I've been doing all of this in kind of anticipation for our uh, year end review. So stay tuned. I, I I don't want to get too much into it. I really liked Ma. I really really liked Crawl, and I also really liked Carpoon. Uh, I also saw Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker, and I know that we've talked about Ryan Johnson recently on this podcast because of um that one movie Knives we did out. a hot take. Yeah, <laughs> Knives Out, and yeah, I had a real <laughs> problem with the last um. You know, because I'm a hardcore, like, not hardcore, God, uh, old school Star Wars fan, uh, because, you know, I'm approaching 40. <laughs> and um, I don't know, like, I felt like the last Star Wars really kind of, like, betrayed some of the character work that had been hard fought in the original trilogy in the 70s and 80s. And um, I felt like this one was, this newest one was a huge like reversal on what Ryan Johnson had done in a way. I feel like JJ Abrams had to make his sequel and then this movie and mash them together. So it was really, really weirdly paced and mashed together and like half hazard for the first like third to half of it. And it was just packed with fan service and pandering. And you know what? I fucking loved getting pandered to. So I actually really liked it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was such a it was such a different like they went way too far in the other direction don't get me wrong but you know it was such a like a contrast to the last experience of star wars i had that i actually really liked it so it was emotional i liked it so i have not seen the the previous star wars what's it called the ryan johnson one 
Last Jedi. Okay. Because really, I only see these movies with you on your birthday. They always seem to come out like yeah. either on your birthday proper or right around then. And that was like tradition to go see Star Wars with Chris on his birthday. And I really liked that that prequel one. Um, Rogue, uh, Rogue, Rogue one. one. Yeah, that was good. It was. So I missed the last Star Wars, but I do want to see this one. Should I watch the other one first? Is that like, I mean, you wouldn't say skip it though, right? I should watch them. You all almost or... can't, you almost could. All you need to know is, you know, that Luke Skywalker gets killed in it or whatever or dies. Are they? Um, in... Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> okay. I mean, so is this like the end all be all of star wars you think they're going to have another trilogy come out after this or uh they might they're talking like they're going to do their standalones and stuff and like tv shows and things like that but this theoretically is the end of the skywalker cycle you know nine fucking movies so i don't know um hopefully that's it because you know i'm i'm overall i'm not super stoked about this trilogy You know, I'm actually happier with the prequels. At least it's, you know, George Lucas, even though he's a shitty director, he's a storyteller, you know? Yeah. And they all seem consistent versus these do not seem consistent, especially because Ryan Johnson did his stupid, you know, fuck all your expectations just for the hell of it, you know, in the middle of this trilogy. I know some people who would fight you on that, you know? So I I can't choose a side because I haven't seen the movie, but... I mean, yeah. well, yeah, I mean, it's, it was, um, uh, it's a challenging movie for hardcore fans. You know, your average moviegoer is going to like last Jedi better. Uh, the critics like it better, but like I was talking about, like the critics, uh, really rated last Jedi really highly, but the audience score is like below 50% versus it's opposite with rise of the Skywalker or when it rise of Skywalker, which just came out, um, the critic score is like probably around 50% or something. And the audience score is like 90%. Wow. You know, so it's, it's really like it was made for the fans. It wasn't made for the wider audiences. And, you know, that's what star Wars is about. I'm sorry, but it's about, you know, for at least for me, it's about nostalgia. It's not about trying to do something new and, and throwing away all the old characters. Like they're trash, you know? So I don't know. I mean, I have to agree with you. I mean, like I, I, I like uh, certain movie franchises for their nostalgia value. And if they were to make a new one today, say of like a nightmare on Elm street or something like that, I probably would enjoy it more than most people just coming into the movie just because I have a nostalgia factor to it. Well, it's like what Ryan Johnson did to Luke. It just reminds me a little bit of like the Terminator, what they did to um, Sarah Connor, Sarah Connor, Linda Hamilton. And, you know, they kind of made her like this damaged, shitty, you know, non-compromising character who in the end compromises and everything, but it still kind of made her look silly. And it's like her character evolution was hard fought and hard won, you know, and they just kind of threw that away for the new generation to like, oh, look at these younger characters. Aren't they hip, hip and cool? You know, it's like, fuck you. It's like, do something new for them, you know, give them Twilight or another fucking Transformers movie. I don't know. <laughs> you just told me it was okay to like twilight <laughs> of course i can't say that about transformers because transformers came out in like the 70s so whatever so i haven't watched them all <clears throat> i did watch crawl and um you, you already know i love harpoons but i know we're going to talk about those movies in our year-end review i watched a handful of movies that i wanted to talk about in um this episode one was the red queen kills seven times like I watched this for um, another podcast that I was on called Customers Also Watched. And I love this movie quite a bit. Like I really want you to watch it. And I'm hoping to sort of fit it into a flashback episode sometime soon. Okay. Um, but it's, I mean, it's like straight up Giallo. So, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic movie. I had never seen it. Really, really fucking enjoyed it. Um, but most importantly, I finally watched jack frost so okay um one of our listeners lachland who comments a lot on facebook has told us to watch jack frost he told us back in our um top 10 
horror comedies episode and then he brought it up again here recently for the holidays and it's a really fun movie like i really enjoyed the hell out of it i don't know why it took me so long to watch it i mean really it's just about you know this killer who's like put into a snowman's body and continues to kill people (laughs) so okay it checks off so many of my boxes and i just i laughed all the way through it and had such a good time so if if anyone has not seen Jack Frost. And I know we're like sort of past the holiday season, so it may not be the prime time to go watch it. But, um, you know, when the holidays roll around again, give it a shot. It's fun. I think you should watch it, Chris. It's it's going to be snowing here until like April, so... <sighs> oh, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it was like a balmy 67 today, so... <laughs> but for you, like perfect time to watch Jack Frost. Exactly. <laughs> I think I rated it, like, actually like three and a half stars <laughs> so oh, okay yeah um finally i watched a movie called bliss and it's uh it's a movie that came out this year and i i had watched it because I, I thought i might incorporate it into our year-end review um it's sort of like this like like drug fueled kind of artistic vampire movie hmm. it's uh it's 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 different so um but I don't know, different in a really good way. I think people should go check that one out too a lot. I, I'm probably not going to talk about it too much in our year end review, but it's um, it's a good movie and it's coming to Shutter. Like I, th- I think at the end of this month, okay. so it should be easy to find. But we're not going to talk too much about everything that we've been seeing because, like we said, we're going to be doing a year end review for 2019's best horror. We're going to be talking about our favorite performances, our favorite like technical achievements, uh, the best you know style and direction and things like that. And we'll be having like in depth conversations about some of that. So look forward to that. That's right. That'll be in your feed toward the end of January. But we have so much more coming to you this month in the new year. We're going to have a hot take coming out for the new grudge coming to you next week. And um, like we said at the the top of this episode, it's not getting the best reviews. So uh, look forward to hearing our thoughts on that. Either, you know, I'll probably end up loving it, but yeah, (laughs) we'll just have to see. Uh, We're also covering the movie, The Invitation, directed by Karin Kusama. And like we've already said a couple times, our year-end review for 2019. And check out our Patreon episode. We're going to be doing our flashback on Waxwork. (sighs) I'm so excited to talk about this movie. (laughs) You just have no idea. (laughs) So we'll be releasing that, I don't know, sometime during the month. And uh, yeah, so check out our Patreon feed for that. And like we said earlier, guys, um, head over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a review. We're going to read it right here on Shooting the Flames. And after you leave us that review, call us on our hotline at 972-666-7733. And we'll play your voicemail on the air and respond to it. We're also always available on social media at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So head over there. You can shoot us some comments or questions and we'll read them right here on our Shooting the Flames episode. You can also email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com, which no one's ever done, but feel free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long year, people. We're tired. Oh my god. I mean, we haven't recorded in like three weeks. I should be like ready to go. Nipples are hard, ready to go. <laughs> 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 you know what like because i i started like our our documents so early i was just like i'm gonna be so fucking prepared <laughs> okay well everybody we want to thank you for all your comments and questions we look forward to 2020 and all the comments and questions <laughs> Okay. (coughs) Well, until next time. So 
sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Off the rails. A little bit. <laughs> Let's do that one more again. Just in case it didn't sound good. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I mean, was, that's kind of funny. Pretty though. sure it was gold. Just use that one. <laughs> you should just use that one anyway. But still. <clears throat> Until next time, sweet dreams. Now you say the first one. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck me.